everybody, welcome back to another episode of High End Fiber. Uh, today it's just me, sorry, just me. Um, but I thought today it might be kind of fun to talk a little bit about designing and just some of the projects I've been working on that involve designing these days because I was thinking about it and I've finished a few things lately that are not my designs but they've been gifted to people or have gone places or maybe you've already seen them like my sweater I was wearing last time but largely, I've just been working a lot on my own designs lately, so I have a lot of that to kind of show. So I thought, well, why don't we tie it in with a little bit of a conversation about designing, how I'm inspired for it, how I got started designing, um, and what you might want to do if you wanted to try designing yourself or how to get involved, whether it's through test knitting or that kind of thing, part of the design process. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that um, I'm making right now and show you kind of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and then we'll go from there and then I have a couple of just kind of general questions that I know I've been asked before in the past on my notes here um, so that way we can have a conversation um, and if you have questions that I don't address feel free to throw it in in the link below and I should also introduce myself to any of those uh, of you viewing today who are new my name is Kelsey I'm the co-owner of Kate Zip Knits um, I'm a yarn dyer um, in the beautiful Okanagan Valley of BC uh, in Canada and I'm coming to you from my office and it is it was supposed to be really gross outside today and it actually was really really sunny um, which is great because um, you'll see a couple toques in a moment here that my hubby and I went out and wandered in the orchard and got some cool photos of um, for a new pattern design we have coming out in a couple of days. Um, so yeah we'll jump right in. So when I um, I'll, I'll answer one question first that I get asked a lot, and that's how did I become interested in design? Uh, design for me kind of came out of a place of necessity. Um, when I was first kind of getting back into knitting about 12, 13 years ago, um, a lot of the patterns for sweaters specifically, but sometimes for shawls, um, weren't really designed with either larger body types or maybe a taller um, person in mind. A lot of them were designed for much more kind of petite and small frames like you would think of with typical kind of um, you know marketed fashion. Um, so it wasn't a very size inclusive thing and being over five foot nine having a 48 inch bust um, it made it really challenging to find designs that would look good on me or that I didn't have to already modify significantly to make fit my body type. So uh, my kind of beginning of design came out of a world of necessity to be able to make a design and have it fit. Um, and just, yeah, to like re-modify elements of a design so that way it would actually work on my body type. Um, and through that, I gained a little bit more confidence in whether it was switching out the weight of yarn for something else. Um, if you used to follow the Wet Coast podcast that I was on um, way back when, <laughs> uh, when Glenda still owned the shop, hi Glenda, uh, you'll have noticed um, we talk about gauge a lot and gauge is something that is super important but it also is, it's a magical tool. It allows you to manipulate things, you know, if you see that chunky weight sweater but you're like, but I have this really gorgeous worsted or Aran weight yarn. It allows you to interchange things if you kind of know what you're doing a little bit. And I can go more into that in another podcast, but those are some of the things that I then started to kind of experiment with. I'd be like, oh, here's a pattern that I like. I've already, I figured out how to adjust it to work for my body type, but now I want it to work with a different yarn. Um, and so then, you know, you just gain more confidence. The more you do it, the more confident you get with it. Um, so that's kind of where I started, I guess you could say. Um, when it went from just heavily modifying into um, actually designing my own original designs, I think I was primarily inspired by just looking through books and magazines, seeing more and more patterns available on platforms like Ravelry, even Pinterest, um, which I think is still a thing today. I never really got into the whole Pinterest thing and like making boards of things. Um, but I know that a lot of people do. Um, so, but just, you know, looking at designs and seeing, oh, I really like this element, oh, I, but I would change this, or I like this, but I would change this. So it then became 
instead of a thing out of necessity, it became something that, oh, well, there's something about this that I like, but I would do it a little bit differently. Um, oh, I like this, but I would do it a little bit differently. So I started with experimenting with things like little swatches, or maybe it would be like a cowl or a toque, and I would just change a panel or something on it um, and try things out and see. Sometimes it would work, sometimes it really wouldn't work. Um, and I'd say probably like 90% of what I would try, I would end up scrapping and being like, oh, no, it didn't work, didn't, I didn't like how it turned out or what, what have you. Um, or just didn't like fulfill the image I had in my mind. Um, I'm just gonna consult my notes. So sometimes people will wonder, well, okay, so now you're a quote unquote designer. How, how do you go about keeping it original? Cause there's, if, if you're familiar with platforms, like I mentioned, Ravelry, um, Love Knitting, Pay Hip, any of those kind of platforms where a lot of designers sell their patterns, um, you'll know that there's hundreds of thousands available. So I know for myself, um, before I consider something a publishable, a publishable project, um, it has to tick a couple of boxes for me. One, I feel like the reading of the pattern itself needs to flow well, not just visually from how it's structured, um, it needs to also, um, as a reader or a user, it should flow well. Um, for me, I really look at how, how does the design fit whatever body type. I haven't done much, or I've, I've done some sweater design, but nothing that I've actually like published at this point. But if it's a sock, I wanna make sure that whatever, be it lace or cables or patterns on the foot or the heel, like, so take this one for example, this is a modified heel that I have done because I was finding I wasn't enjoying um, my afterthought heels as much anymore, but I didn't, the traditional heel flap and gusset didn't work for me. Um, for whatever reason. So this is kind of a modified, it's a toe up, heel flap and short row to make a modified gusset. So you don't actually have to pick up stitches like you would in a traditional heel flap and gusset. But I found that there were things that I was like, oh, well, I feel like I could do this in a different way and still have it fit the end product really nicely. So whether it's something like this, that's just a really basic kind of adjustment to fit my physical foot a little bit differently. Whenever I'm designing something, how it flows or fits whatever I'm putting it on is really important. Um, a pattern that I will be putting into testing soon, let's see, oops, I'll pull a cable needle out, <laughs> um, is my Susie at Falls sock. And I'm pro oh, I pulled my needle, well, we'll, just, we'll just not pull on it too aggressively so that way I don't yank out half my sock. Um, but it's got this little, you know, I'm gonna, come up and do it in an angle so that the light still gets it. So it has this little cable design and I played around with it quite a bit. Originally it was a bit of a wider um, design that I went with and then it, I just didn't like the way it sat on the toe of the foot down here. Um, so for me it was messing around with like how many columns did I want, how wide of a cable, how far across should it go, things like that. Um, making it fit my foot was really important um, and then having this one is a mirrored thing, so the other sock is the reverse of what this one is. And so how, how did they fit on the feet? And I also wanted to make sure, like I had in my own brain, which foot I envisioned, like which side of your foot the cable should go on. But I also made a conscious decision that I wanted it to look good, whether you decided to put the cable in, a, you know, on the side closer to your big toe or closer to your smaller toes. Um, so that was also a consideration when I was doing this design. But speaking of this design, if you are watching this and you're like, ooh, cables, sock, test knit, um, hit me up, go, you can check out the Ravelry group, I'll throw the link down below, because um, I will be putting out a testing call this next week for this, because um, I'm hoping to get this all finished up and out kind of early to mid-November. Um, yeah, so if you are interested in trying out this sock pattern, um, do you consider either sending me a message or going to our Ravelry group and getting on the Airburn list because then I'll um, tag you when it comes out for testing. But So that's just an example. Um, oh, and because I know some of you will ask what yarn this is, this is uh, Crafty Jack's Boutique and it's her Frosty Fall colorway which I picked up at Knit City. Um, so loving this yarn. I think the pattern itself would probably pop a little bit more on a tonal or l slightly less heavily variegated yarn, but I'm still liking it, so. 
Um, but so that's another element of flow that I'm always looking for when I'm designing something. Um, the other thing that I find is really, um, well to me is important, is I think a lot of us have probably knit patterns that feel a little bit clunky or maybe there's some technical errors in the pattern itself. Um, if I'm going to charge for a pattern, I do have a free pattern that I've not had tech edited and I haven't had it test knitted at all. Um, but if I'm going to actually charge physical money for a pattern, I want to make sure it's been heavily test knit um, as well as tech edited whenever possible. Um, particularly for slightly more complicated designs or things that have more charts or any of that kind of thing. Because the last thing you want as a user is to be like, okay, I've you know, I've had it over my five, six, seven, eight dollars, some patterns nowadays as much as ten or twelve dollars. Um, and then you get it back and you're using it and there's an error with the numbers somewhere, it's missing a chart, or a chart's incomplete, or it doesn't have all the definitions, things like that. Um, so I always find it disappointing if I've paid money for a pattern and something comes back like that to gets to me that says, oh, they haven't either tested it enough or they haven't had a tech edited and especially if it's in that higher price point I tend to get a little bit like huh you know um, if it's a free pattern I, I usually say you get what you pay for sometimes they're really great sometimes they're not super great um, it really just depends <laughs> so you kind of take a gamble and just take it with a grain of salt um, but generally speaking I it is my personal um, conviction that I have anything that I'm going to charge money for has been at the very, very least heavily tested by 10 plus people. Um, so that way I can make sure that, you know, any kind of bumps in the road are ironed out. Um, the other thing when it comes to test knitting is I really, I emphasize that I'm totally okay if you're a new, like say we did our Apex Tuke, which is coming out on Monday, We this one. So this is the longer version. So this tuke is actually kind of an interesting one because um, this was my original kind of, once I was like, yes, this is the pattern I want to do. This is what I like. It's making me happy. This was the original iteration of it with the three kind of sets of blocked color work. And when I put it into testing, this is the perfect example of why you test knit something. Um, I have a very different gauge, which, you know, there's that trigger word again, gauge, <laughs> than a lot of people have. Um, and specifically with this pattern, it was a weird one because it was row gauge, so that's the height or the length of your stitch rather than the width of your stitch. And so what I figured out is that a lot of people were getting much different than mine, so that I needed to make some adjustments, especially if you were wanting to have an option of either having it be a slouchy toque or a more fitted toque. Um, so what I ended up doing after putting it into its first round of testing is I actually went from one chart, had one set of instructions for how to make this lovely crown, um, which you guys can see. Um, I ended up including three different charts and two different crown options so that way um, you could actually, you don't have to do a gauge swatch necessarily to see how tall your rows are, but once you got into the kind of first chunk of it here, you could measure what your row gauge was, um, and then pick which combination of charts you wanted to do based on if you wanted a more fitted toque or a slouchier fit. Um, so this is one iteration. I did do another iteration, which is um, I did, you can see it's got a tall, I did the like longer crown option, but I did the shorter color work option. So this was another one I did. Um, and then I threw a pom-pom on by the Yarn Bowler, which you may have also seen if you watched her last podcast because I picked up pom-poms from her at Knit City. But so yeah, this is it's just an example of how you think something works, it worked great, and this toque fits me perfectly how I want it to fit me, but um, it didn't fit most of the people that were test knitting it. So I had to go back in and be like, okay, no, I need to change some things because what works for me might not necessarily work for someone else. Um, and putting in more options, basically. Um, so it's an example of how design can work really well in some cases, but then when you go and you say, hey, try it out, um, it ends up not working quite how you planned. Um, for these guys, so this is a yarn bowler pom-pom. Go check her out. She has the coolest pom-poms. Um, and this is our Apex Super Bulky Yarn. This color is Slate, and the red color is called Red Roses. Um, and then these colors, and I should mention Chris, 
my hubby, he dyed both of these colors. So this is the Chris Duke, <laughs> and then this is the Me Duke. So the speckled is called Summer Fiesta, and then the kind of purpley blue is called Moonless Night. Um, and if you're watching this podcast, you can use the code High and Fiber for 10% uh, off if you would like to grab some yarn to make these. Um, it will only work for the Apex Super Bulky, but uh, if you want to go for it, our pattern comes out on Monday. Um, you can also use the same, I'll put the same coupon code for when the pattern releases and it'll be 25% off of our pattern when it releases. So if you want to get in on that, um, that will be available to you. Doo -doo -doo. Um, so yeah, get things test knit. Um, a couple other designs I'm working on. Um, if you guys have more questions, just pop them down below and I'll try to answer them or I can address them in another podcast. Those are kind of the biggest things for me when it comes to designing. Um, but I am, I thought I'd show you a couple other things that I have kind of on the go right now. Uh, I have, so you might notice, so the color work on this, I was like, oh, it'd be kind of fun to have, I, I don't know why this color work just makes me really happy. So I thought, oh, it'd be really fun if I could have like matching mitts and a matching cowl. So I haven't got the cowl, but the cowl powder will be super easy, but, um, I thought it would be cool to have some mitts that kind of match. So this is also <laughs> some of my um, Knit City haul. This is from Longway, no, not Longway Homestead. This is from West Coast Color. This is some of their Um So this is kind of my prototype for some fingerless mitts. And then I'm thinking of making like a um, an optional flap for a finger to cover your fingers on the top. Um, yeah, just kind of messing around, seeing if I like it. Um, what do you guys think? Would you want something like this? Oh, and I think I started to say that um, when it comes to test knitting, I like having people of all levels test knit because oftentimes, even if they're not as experienced maybe with the technique, cable, say cables are new or color work in the case of the hat that went with these um, being new, um, they read things very differently than a super experienced knitter. And sometimes they actually catch things that someone who's been knitting for a very long time might miss. Um, because it's just autopilot. So I, I really appreciate having that variety of feedback. Um, and I try as much as possible to be flexible with um, deadlines. Um, I usually am, you know, fairly, you know, if for some reason you can't finish it on time, that's fine, just let me know. Um, I'm, I try to be approachable that way. I've been very lucky to test it for some designers who've been very flexible with me for stuff, so um, I try to pass that along because I know it's been appreciative for me in the past. And sometimes it gives you a chance to try a pattern out, especially maybe uh, financially you're in a tight situation, so you want to try a new pattern, but um, you know, it's a difference of being able to, you know, pay a bill and buy a pattern that week. So, you know, test knitting can be a great way to get access to maybe some more patterns um, that you didn't previously have access to. So, um, if you know, if you're looking for an opportunity to kind of build that, by all means, like, go for it. It's it's totally worth it. Um, and if you're worried about deadlines and stuff, just check, check with the designer that you're test knitting for um, and signing up to test knit for. Uh, so I have two other designs that I've been working on this last little bit. Um, I have this one first. This is a cable toque, which I am hoping, not this coming week, but the following week, there'll probably be a testing call, go out for this guy. Um, so it's kind of a cool, I have to refigure where I'm going to put my ring light. I think my ring light has to go further back because they go like this and it's dark. But if I go like this, then you can see it. Um, this is obviously very tiny. Doesn't really fit in my head. It's kind of, you know, it's a good look. What do we think? Yes? No? I think this might have to be my, uh, my still shot for for the front of the thing. <laughs> Designing when it works and when it doesn't. Uh, no, I wanted this one to be available in a number of sizes, so that's what I have done. I have tried to make this one um, be from kid sizes, this being the kid, the little kiddo size, all the way up to adults. Um, so that's what this one is. This one doesn't have a name yet. I have a hard time coming up with names for patterns usually. Like for me, the Apex one comes out of that's what our yarn is called. And it's like you build blocks on blocks. It's kind of like the mountain, which we live near a mountain named Apex. So 
that's where that one came from. The Susie It Falls for socks, the pattern design on it reminds me of the shape of the waterfalls, the Susie It Falls on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, but this one, I don't know. I don't know. What should we call this one? I just really liked the shape and I messed around with a few different cable ideas and I just really liked this one. So, and I also, I'm kind of a, kind of a fan of how it comes together at the top. I don't know how well that's going to come across on this teeny little toque. But anyways, this is another one that I've got kind of in the works. Um, and if you are tuning in and you have watched old, old, old podcasts with Wet Coast Wolves, you might remember in January of 2020, I was like, this year for knitting bingo, I'm going to knit and design a skirt. That went really well for like that much of the skirt. And then I put it away. I had all the notes written out for the whole design. I had like schematics drawn up. I had all these like, you know, details and everything written in. And it went away and then, then we we're like, oh, now we're moving. So it got thrown in a box. Um, and then I dug it out the other day and I was like, well, it's getting cold here. I want wool on my bum. So my skirt's back and I'm actually going to work on it now. Um, so it's not that exciting looking yet, but um, it has the types of increases that I'm doing to make it kind of flare out a little bit um, are almost, it doesn't make pleats, but they would go in the places that you would think there'd be like pleats to, like triangular pleats. This I know this looks weird, but like kind of like that. Um, but so I've got a folded over hem going on. Um, so I've just tacked it down loosely with some pins for now, just so I could try it on and make sure that it was all still doing what I wanted it to do. And that, you know, since it's been, you know, COVID and a year and nine months of not wearing it, um, trying to make sure it would fit. So I'm, I'm excited to have this kind of on the go again and to be working on it. Um, I opted to use Briggs and Little Regal for this particular pattern um, because it's a much kind of, it's it's like an outerwear wool, I would say. If you, if you don't like scratchy wool, you probably don't want Briggs and Little. Um, but the great thing about something like Briggs and Little for something like a skirt is when you're sitting down or that kind of thing. It's not gonna pill the same as like a merino wood. It's a much harder wearing. I'm also knitting it at a fairly dense gauge. Um, I think typically a lot of people would probably knit the Regal on like a four or four and a half millimeter and I'm on a 3.5 millimeter and I'm a bit of a tight knitter. Um, so just cause I wanted a dense fabric that would wear really well, um, be nice and warm over some leggings for the winter and just, yeah. So this is another design I kind of have in the works. Um, which I don't have a timeline for sure on this one yet, uh, but it's something I'm working on and it's been, it's been a lot of fun. I'm, I'm really enjoying having a little bit more time now that we're kind of set up in our new space and, um, getting a little bit more into the flow of things to actually have time to, you know, I have, I have this notebook with all of these design ideas and sketches and things that I've written down. and. Now that I'm working 100% from home and for myself, I actually have some time to to do this kind of thing, which is really exciting for me. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what I'm knitting these days. Um, I haven't, I, I'm trying to think if I have anything on the needles right now that isn't my own design. I do, I have one thing at least. I have some slippers um, from an old kind of couch and style pattern. Uh, they're called slippers for everyone and it's, I think it's a white buffalo. I'll put a link below to where it is, but it's a, it's an old white buffalo pattern and I've made it many, many, many times, but I'm knitting it for my grandpa who turned 90 in the summer. So he didn't, what do you get the 90 year old who has everything he could possibly want and doesn't want to acquire more things at this stage of his life? Slippers. So I gave him a coupon for some wool slippers for the fall because I know that he likes them. So. Um, I have one, one done, one more to go, so, um, but yeah, I think that's about it that I have on the go right now. I'm going to be finishing up a couple of these things and then, um, I, ha I have a couple grand ideas of what I'm going to cast on next. Um, one of them, which is secret, which I'm very excited about. Uh, but yeah, I'm excited to, to be back in podcasting. Um, if you guys have questions, comments concerns or snide remarks, uh, as one of my favorite professors from university used to say, um, feel free to throw comments down below. You can email me. Um, 
a reminder that we have a cal going on right now in our Ravelry group. Um, it's called Knuckles and Noggins. So if you're knitting toques or hats, um, berets, anything that goes on your head, anything that covers your knuckles, um, even wrist warmers would count, I think. Yeah, we'll say it counts. Um, but anything for your hands or for your head, um, you're welcome to join in there. Uh, it goes till the end of November. Um, you get an entry for each finished item. If you use a K-Zip Knits yarn, you get an extra entry. If you use a K-Zip Knits pattern, you get a third entry. Um, so, yeah. Um, so you can keep that in mind. If you want to knit, if you have some super bulky yarn and you want to knit our Apex Toque, which comes out on Monday, um, which will probably be the release day for this, but uh, we'll put those coupon codes um, up at the bottom here again, high in fiber, um, and you can get, I think I said, I'll have to listen to this again, but we'll do, um, why don't we do, we'll do 15% off the yarn and 25% off the pattern. How about that? 15% yarn, 25 pattern. Um, so yeah, you can do that. Um, yeah, that's my, that's my shameless self-promotion. Self um, but yeah, if you guys have questions, uh, let me know if you have things that you would really like to see me talk about um, or cover here, um, hit me up in the comments and I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Um, and hopefully one of these days we'll get Chris on here too because I think it would be fun um, even though he's not a knitter yet. He is half of the k -Zip Knits team now and uh, he helps make all the beautiful yarn, all the beautiful colors. So uh, yeah, we'll catch you guys all soon. Bye.